So it's great that we get to have a shear on Lag Boimer itself. On this special day, it is a very auspicious day. It's a day that's, that's brought down in Shulchan Aruch, that we don't say Tachlun on this day. And it's a happy day, it's an exciting day. In fact, the day before we don't say Tachlun already from Mincha time. So like yesterday, we didn't say Tachlun. And yeah, there's like a lot of different things that happen, like because we're in the middle of a, of a period of mourning. And so there's this like one day in the middle of it all that, according to all opinions, is a happy day. It's a real happy day. One of the students of the Arizal was Rabbi Vram Alevi. And he, whenever he would daven, every single day of the year when he would daven, he would recite the tefillah of Nachim. Nachim is the, the tefillah which is designed special for Mincha of Tisha Be'av. It's where you feel the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. You feel the Galut, you feel the exile. So he felt the exile. Most people feel it, well, want to feel it. On Tisha B'Av afternoon, you're feeling the exile a bit. You know, you're like finished and tied out. That's when you're feeling it. He said Nachim every single day of the year. Because he always felt the, the tragedy of the Churban Beit HaMikdash, of the destruction. Then one year, it was Lag Omer, and he found himself in Miron by Rashbi. And he did his usual, and he said, Nachim. And now Rizal, his Rebbe, told him afterwards, he says, this year is going to be your last year. And he says, the reason is because you walked in front of Rashbi, and you were feeling tragedy. And in front of Rashbi, there's no tragedy. Again, it's not punishment. It's just that you lost the protection, which you always had. And so you, you can't do that. Why? Because and that year he passed away. So what is Rashbi about? About happiness. Rashbi is one of those before whom there never was a destruction. When you enter into his zone, you're in a zone of absolute simcha. Which is why today is a day of absolute simcha. So today... We do weddings and we have music and all the all the um, <clears throat> all the blockages of the rest of Sfirasaim are all released now. And at this point, right, there's the thirty three days how you count them from beginning to the end or from middle to the end, or some count the whole thing, but according to all opinions, Tisha this day of Lagba Omel is the day of absolute happiness. And so it's like a must to rejoice just to prove that you're not trying to be sad in any way. It is very interesting that this is what came of it. It's very interesting that this is quoted in Shulchan Aruch. It's very interesting that today Lag Ba'omer is celebrated all over. And every year that passes by, Lag Ba'omer gets celebrated more and more and more and more. It's like amazing. You go in the streets and you see things going on and there's things happening. I mean, we run a parade every Lag Ba'omer and it's phenomenal. Just People just come out. You just need to let people know and they come out. It's amazing. Because people want to celebrate Lag Ba'omer. But let's go right back to the beginning of how it all began. How did Lagbomer start out and how did it become what it became? So Lagbomer is the yard site of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai was once sitting and learning in front of his Rabbi. His Rabbi was Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva had at the end only five students. That's it. And he sat down with five students and one of them was Rabbi Shimon. Another one was Rabbi Meir. His students were the greatest people ever. Like Rabbi Meir, the whole entire Mishnah, whenever it doesn't say someone's name, Stam Mishnah Rabbi Meir. It means Rabbi Meir. So Rabbi Meir is there, and they're sitting and learning, and Rabbi Akiva puts Rabbi Meir first. So it says, Niskarkamu Ponov Shel Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon was, like, upset. Now, this is not about honor, who goes first. It's more about who does the halacha, the verdict, get paskin like Who has the ultimate final say? Now, Rabbi Meir was someone who was very removed in his brilliance from the rest of his friends. Rabbi Meir had this ability to be metaheret asheretz bekuf nun ta'amim. He was able to give 150 reasons, if you wanted, to find you sources in the Torah, 150 sources to say 
why a sheret, that's a dead uh, rodent, um, is Tommy. It's not Tommy, it's Tar. In other words, it is, it is definitely no good. It's definitely Tommy. And he was able to f- prove to you in Torah, say his, his intellect was incredible. And Rabbi Meir was removed. But Rabbi Shimon was even more removed. And so Rabbi Shimon says to Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Kiva, he looks at him and his face says, why are you putting him first? Why does the halacha not get Haskin like me? Do you know that in most of Shas, whenever Rabbi Shimon argues, he loses the argument actually. And the reason is, Rabbi Akiva tells him, he says, Dayecha shani ubora acha makirin kochacha. It is enough and sufficient for you, says Rabbi Akiva, that me and Hashem and your Creator, only us, Hashem and me, recognize your power. So you're worried why Halakha doesn't get into the world like you? Why Rabbi Meir wins over you? It's because you're too great. It's not because, it's not because you don't, the halacha doesn't follow you. It's because nobody understands what you are saying. You're too abstract. You're too removed. Too good. Not, right? not that you're not good enough. You're too good. That's what Rabbi Akiva tells him. So I'm sorry, I can't pass in halakha, we can't pass in halakha like you, but it's okay. Now what that means is that, you know, when, when um, there's an argument hap- that happens between Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yoshua, they had a big argument. And the argument was, when would be the new moon? When does the month begin, the beginning of the month? So Rabbi Gamliel rules one way, and Rabbi Yeshua rules another way. It was crystal clear that Rabbi Yeshua was right and Rabbi Gamliel was wrong. Rabbi Yeshua was so brilliant, it says, we are told as follows, that they went once, Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua went on a, on a boat ride, and it was an extended boat ride. And suddenly, uh, Rabbi Gamliel, and he took a certain amount of food, he took enough food for a few days, and the food was finished. You know, it was only, if, it was like, you know, you go on a, on a, you ever seen Jews go on a, on a plane? You go on a 10 hour plane ride, taking enough food for two weeks, just, just in case. You never know, I might not get the meal, and if I do get, maybe the plane will get kidnapped, and you know, we might find ourselves hijacked, and who knows, Jews are very worried about food. Fly without food. I'm like, what, seriously? So, Rabbi Yeshua took extra food for, he took like food for, for two days, and he took food for a week. But it was just a one or two day, boat trip. So he said to Rabbi Shua, in the middle of the trip, the boat got lost. But they were out at sea, they had no idea where to go. It took a whole week to get back, Rabbi, Rabbi Yeshua gave them all the food. So he said to Rabbi Shua, how did you know to take food for a week? Just a Jewish thing, Stam? He says, no, I knew, I, was, I made a calculation that the, the sailors work based on a certain star. And that star, once in 70 years, I, I did my calculations, once in seven years, that star gets hidden. And so I figured it would be around now. So therefore, he probably would lose his way. So I took food for a week. So Abu Gamliel looks at him and says, Wow, that's sheer absolute brilliance of you. And that's exactly what happened. And there were other stories like that. about Rabbi Shah was able to count, to calculate mathematically how many drops there were in the ocean. That takes cop. So Abu Shah says, uh, Yom Kippur, you know, is on this on this day. Because I'm telling you, if you work out the math and you do the math, he shows everyone, he says, the moon is on this day and that's, that's Rosh Chodesh, wrong day. And Rabbi Gamliel ruled against him. The reason was he didn't understand him. And the whole Sanhedrin sided with Rabbi Gamliel. And the reason was they didn't understand Rabbi Yeshua. And so Rabbi Akiva, at that time, met Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Gamliel told Rabbi Yeshua, he said to him, okay, I agree on you, then on the day that you say Yom Kippur falls out, you come to me with your bag and your clothing and everything, and you walk outside the mount, you're allowed to walk on Shabbos because you have to desecrate it. So I'll be sure he was planning to keep both days. He said no. And Rabbi Akiva sees Rabbi Yeshua, he was very distressed. He tells him, what are you distressed about? He says, how can I go? It's Yom Kippur, they're wrong. He said, yeah, but if based in Paskin, something over here in this world, that becomes the halacha. That's what the Torah says. That's, that's the way it is. 
So if they couldn't understand you, that itself proves that Hashem wants the halacha to be that way, not your way. And Rabbi Yeshua listened, and he actually desecrated what would have been his Yom Kippur, what he knew was to be Yom Kippur. So what you're seeing is that there's someone who's so great and so lofty and so removed, but he's unable to bring his intellect down here into this world, and so the halacha does not follow him. Evidently, that's what happened with Rabbi Shimon. He wasn't able to draw down his powers into this world. And so the students, his fellow students, right, and the others couldn't relate to him. And so in the Gemara, halacha most of the time does not follow Rabbi Shimon. So you, you have to, right, you have to rule based on what you understand. It's like these arguments take place between Shammai and Hillel everywhere. Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel argue about everything. What were they really doing? So Shammai, his, his source of his soul was from Gevura. Everything is, you know, like severity. And Hillel was on the right side, kindness. So it doesn't mean that Shammai was always severe and Hillel was always kind because they just worked with their emotions. It means that Shammai was a severe type of individual in his emotion and therefore when he ruled, his, his head understood it in such a way. And Hillel's head understood it in a different way. So Shammai and Hillel have an argument about everything under the sun. But Halakha follows, most of the time, Hillel. What's interesting is that when Mashiach comes, we're going to switch. Because right now we need the kindness in the world and we're not able to reach that severity. But one day, we'll be able to appreciate that it's not severity, that it's a revelation of Hashem, which is just too strong and too powerful to get. And so in a certain sense, the same applies to Rabbi Shimon, whereby the halakha gets ruled against him. And what happen- what's happening is, when it gets ruled against him, it means that we don't relate to him. But what's interesting is that, how does it make sense? Do you celebrate any other Tana from the Mishnah or any other Amoira from the Gemara? Do you celebrate their yard sites? We know certain yard sites when they are. Some of them, we don't make a big deal out of it. Eh, a little bit here and there. Hands down, the one Tana who everybody celebrates, and yes, it's becoming more and more and more as we go through time, as we move along, it does become stronger and stronger. But Miron has always been a thing. Going to Miron has always been something special. It just became, you know, Thank God now it's coming back. They figured out how to control crowds and do it the right way. But Miron is, is a place to be. So this Tana, Rabbi Shimon, whom nobody was able to understand, it seems like that happens at the beginning. And then as you move along, something about him gets more, like, more embedded in the world so that we can relate to it. And suddenly Rabbi Shimon becomes relevant to us. So let's take a bit of a deep dive and try to understand why was it that Rabbi Shimon, what was it about Rabbi Shimon that he was explaining that was too abstract for the world to grasp? And why is it that suddenly it's become real to us? In other words, let's take the, the abstract Rabbi Shimon and bring it down to us right now so that we can appreciate what it is about Rabbi Shimon that we want to celebrate today. Rabbi Shimon was in a cave. He locked himself up in a cave for initially 12 years. Can you imagine being in a cave for 12 years? What would you do there? (laughs) It's a cave. It's a dark place. Nothing doing there. And, um, And he has no way to escape. So initially they were in a house, in the basement, actually. They were hiding, him and his son, because Rabbi Shimon spoke badly against the Romans. So the Romans were out to get him. And he discovered they were out to get him. He was hiding in the base medrash. And then, and his wife was bringing him food. And then he realized very quickly that that's not a good idea. So he didn't tell his wife that he was running away. And that was for a simple reason, because protect her. Because the Romans were ruthless. And so she didn't know where he was. She genuinely didn't know. So he goes into a small cave, a very claustrophobic cave, and hides himself inside there. And note that he has nothing. He doesn't have anything physical at all. A miracle happens and there's a, a um, carob tree and a spring of water 
and then he's able to subsist and to live with the water and the, and the boxer, the carob, and that's it. He has nothing else. Now, that means he didn't have anything else spiritually either. When Shabbos came along, he didn't have wine to make Kiddush. And when it was Pesach, he had no matzah. And when it was Sukkot, he had no lulav and he had no sukkah. When he had no way of fulfilling any mitzvah. Well, he didn't even have clothing. I mean, he had one pair of clothing, so he would go under the ground and they would bury themselves underneath. That's how when he came out, his body was, was like, it was completely shattered all over. His body was broken from sitting in the sand for so many years. And what did he do? Sat and learned. But he had no books. Zero books. Now, granted, there were no books at that time. <laughs> Nothing was written except for Torah Shebichtav, the, the oral, the written Torah. Nothing else was written. But what he did was, he sat down when he had nothing else in the world that was bothering him. And him and his son, Rabbi Eliezer, were able to learn Torah and ascend to the highest secrets one could ever imagine. Most people can't hold their concentration for more than a few minutes. Half an hour of concentration is considered to be like otherworldly. He held his concentration for 12 years. That's impressive. That's why nobody could relate to him. Because it's unrelatable. Now, he didn't actually not fulfill any mitzvahs. Actually, Rabbi Shimon holds that you don't need to fulfill the mitzvahs when you are occupied to that degree in Torah. It's called Torah to Omanuto. His Torah is his craft. Torah is what he does. So Rabbi Shimon actually holds that if you choose to make Torah your craft and nothing else besides Torah, and you immerse yourself in Torah, then you don't need to fulfill any mitzvahs, regardless of a cave. Rabbi Shimon's way of learning is that no, you don't need to fulfill mitzvahs. When do you need to fulfill mitzvahs? If you stop learning Torah anyway. People like us, we don't learn Torah all along. Right? Ladies don't know this, but you don't have this problem. You can just learn Torah and go to Shir and you get reward for learning Torah. It's wonderful. But men, it doesn't work the other way around. Actually, you get punished for every time you don't go to Shir. So every moment you're not learning is a problem. It's like a whole different world. But so since you stop learning anyway, you have to start, you have to do the mitzvahs. And it says, this is the, the approach of Rabbi Ishmael. And Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai followed it. So the Gemara says, Harbe asuki Rabbi Ishmael velo al tabi adam. Many people follow the path of Rabbi, Shema, of Rabbi Shemal, which is Rabbi Shimon's way, and they couldn't do it. They just couldn't bring themselves to a point where you were immersed totally in Torah and concentrated on nothing else, and the world meant zero to you. And so Rabbi Akiva looks at him and he says, shani makirin kochacha. Only me and Hashem can recognize who you are. Most people, if you tell them, don't worry, just go learn Torah. So... First of all, he can't learn Torah. He doesn't know how to sit and concentrate. But even if he would, he'll be like, and you expect me to actually trust Hashem that I don't need to go work and things are just going to happen? You know, when you say that, you're like, yeah, right. Go get yourself a degree, get yourself a job and get some money and then we can talk. Anyone who tries to sit the Kailal approach, I'm sitting and doing nothing. So the problem is twofold. A, you can't do it. You don't know how to do it. You don't know how to immerse yourself in Kailal only. And B, even if you do, then what? Then how's the money going to come? Yeah, good luck with getting money. So nobody understands Rabbi Shimon ben Yechoi. He's too lofty and too removed, which exacerbates the question, so how come today the celebration is a celebration of Rashi B? He's the only Tana we could not relate to. So what does it mean that he's the Tana that we celebrate? You should not be celebrating him. He's the one you don't relate to, right? How come you celebrate after him? That's the question. And somehow, there's something so compelling about the message of Rashbi that you don't need to do anything. You don't need to work. You could just sit and learn Torah all day long and everything is done automatically. Melachton nas and the work is done by others. What we will see is that actually, the secret of Rashbi, which was hidden for so long, has now been released into the world. And we actually do relate to this approach. And we're slowly but surely spreading the message in a way that was never spread before. Rabshim ben Yechoi revealed the secrets of Torah. 
So he was actually, most of the time he actually spent learning Nigle, learning the revealed parts of Torah. His name appears in every parak in the whole Shas, practically. Every single chapter in the Shas, Rabbi Shimon has what to say. He was learning all day and all night. But Rabbi Shimon also revealed the Zohar. The Zohar was the most, the most magnificent revelation of the divine into this world. He released the power of Hashem into this world. And when he passed away, on the last days of his life, what happened was, he sat down with the Chavraya Kadisha, and he revealed secrets that he had never revealed before. That was on Lag Ba'omer. On Lag Ba'omer, Pnimi Yuta Torah, the Zohar, was released into the world in a way, in an unprecedented way. And it was like the world suddenly got this incredible light. That happened 2,000 years ago, and then the light was hidden. And only select tzaddikim had access to it. All the way up until our times, 200 and change years ago, the Baal Shem Tov came into the world and released, the Arizal first, then the Baal Shem Tov released that Torah into the world. And if we're sitting here right now, it's because we have access to the light of Rashbi. And so this light that was hidden, as we get closer to the era of the redemption, we get to discover this light. What we want to do now is just understand what is this light and focus on it and be able to appreciate the dazzling light that we're seeing in front of us right now and why Rashbi, who was so abstract, suddenly became so real and relevant to everyone. Let's take a moment and deviate and go to a different story that occurs in the same era, in the same greater story. So, Rabbi Shimon Yechoi was one of the five students of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva actually had 24,000 students. All 24,000 students died. When did they die? During this period of time between Pesach and Shavuot. And that's why there's this whole right, period of mourning. <coughs> So it is, in general, right, whichever way you take it, it's, uh, nowadays people are making weddings already galore, right after Lag Omar, but we won't go into the discussion. It's actually a question about it. You're not really supposed to. So, um, then again, I'm going to a wedding tomorrow night. I'm, I'm going to go. If the guy's getting married, I'm going to go. But, uh, you know, as opposed to last night, if you would have gone, I wouldn't have gone. <laughs> That's different. But different discussion. So, Rabbi Shem ben Yechoi, I'm sorry, Rabbi Akiva has 24,000 students and all 24,000 died beperek echad in the same chapter. They all died in the same time. Now whether you take it they died over the same year or over a few years, whichever way to look at it, let's make an assumption simple, keep it simple, they died in the same time between Pesach and Shavuot. So the question is, how does it make any sense? that 24,000 students all die at the exact same time. Think about it. Rabbi Akiva, how long did it take him to get 24,000 students? The story in itself is unbelievable. He started out learning Aleph Beis at 40. He had nothing. He started with zero. And he had real determination. He ain't going to take no for an answer. And so 12 years later, he came back home. He left his wife for 12 years. But his wife was actually the source of his power for all those 12 years. 12 years later, he comes back, he has 12,000 students. And then he comes in and he has his wife, and someone's telling her, just divorce the guy. He's not present, didn't you notice? And she said, he is present. And I know my husband, and they don't make him like Rabbi Akiva. And if he were outside the door right now, I would tell him to go back for another 12 years. So he was. And he said, okay. Didn't go back in, didn't say hello. Hmm, different era. <laughs> went back and went for another 12 years and produced 24,000 students. And he comes back with this incredible 24,000 students and then she comes to greet him and he tells him, Shaliva Shalachem Shela. Mine and yours, he tells his students, is all because of her. Wow. And that was his recognition of Rachel. So it took him 24 years to get 24,000 students. That means the students were all on different levels. So can you explain to me how can it be that students who came, right, student who came in year one and student who came in year 24 were different generations? Like, we go through school today for 12 years. Imagine you're 24 years ahead of the other student. Okay, so you're both students. 
But how does it make sense that somehow everyone did an Aveira at the exact same time? The transgression, which was they couldn't respect one another, when did it occur? At the exact same time for all of them. So these students who had amassed over many years and were many different levels all reached the same level at the same time. And somehow, they didn't honor one another. And isn't it strange that what was their crime? Not respecting one another. Who was their Rabbi? Rabbi Akiva. What's Rabbi Akiva's shining motto? He had this pasuk and he would tell everyone that that verse, the love your neighbor like yourself, is zeklal gadol batorah. The whole Torah is that. That means every single day, in everything he taught, he says, guys, you gotta, you gotta love your friend like yourself. And all 24,000 of his students, what are they failing? Being his students. That's pretty bad. <laughs> that's a failure. That's the failure of, of, of the worst order. But in fact, so how does it make sense, right? It doesn't, just, what does it mean? You're teaching something and they, every single one of them is getting it wrong? And they all die at the same time, so it's two questions. <laughs> Here's what actually happened. You see, his students were very good listeners, active listeners. They did not get what he was saying, they got exactly what he was saying. There was just one little knetch, one caviar in the way they got it. You know, today we have different groups, different types, different like subsections of Judaism. It's very colorful. Some Jews wear a spodek. Some Jews wear a strimal. Some Jews wear an up hat. Some wear a down hat. Some wear a kippah Some wear a black yarmulke. Some don't wear a yarmulke. And some, you know, different types. But let's talk about all the ones who are religious. Ask the guy with the spodek, why do you wear a spodek and not a kippah That's what I do. I don't know. That's what I do. Why do you do that? I don't know. That's why I do that. Does anyone know what they do, why they do? Not really. Few and far between. So it's easy to love each other. That's why, of late, very late, there's a lot, like a lot of walls are falling down, I think. It's interesting, like a lot of, just like, maybe it's the, the benefits of social media. We get to see each other. Hey, you're not as bad as I was taught when the walls were, you're actually a good guy. So it's nice. So, you know, get to love each other. And that's a benefit. But think about it. <coughs> really, each one of us, each sect, has its own approach, its own path. Go back to the students of Rabbi Akiva and imagine this. Every student of Rabbi Akiva was unique in his own right. So every single student has an approach of how he uniquely understands what his Rabbi is teaching him. And he gets it and he lives by it. And because it's what he got, he is convinced that this is the correct way. Right? Because everyone today knows that they're right. <coughs> of course. Right? Whichever way you go. Like, some people, if I celebrate your Matzmaut, then what do you mean? You don't celebrate? You don't see what happened in your Matzmaut? If I can't stand your Matzmaut, I'm like, Are you, you don't notice that it's like impossible to grasp what's going on over there? And then the other guy's like, I say Tachdun and I say Halal. And I say, you know, like, and even in that, we're convinced we're right. The students of Rabbi Akiva were on a real high level. They actually had each one a unique path in their service of God. And they knew they were right. But their Rebbe taught them that you have to love your neighbor like yourself. That means you also have to appreciate my way of thinking. Because if my Rebbe told me that I don't have to care about you, so I don't care, do what you want, knock yourself out. But since I was taught that after the kamocha, what do I have to do? I have to make sure that you get what I'm saying also. And if you don't get it, I can't respect you. So now you have 24,000 star students of Rabbi Akiva who precisely because their Rebbe taught them that they have to understand and appreciate and love each other, they're doing everything in their power to make sure the other guy also gets it. And the other guy has his approach and he's trying to get you. So you're trying to get him and he's trying to get you. That's a recipe for not hatred, disrespect, 
each one felt disrespected by the other. <coughs> so you see why it happened? It happened not despite their Rebbe, but because of their Rebbe. That would not have been reason enough to die. Nobody dies mm-hmm. for lack of re- respect for someone else. It's not good, but you don't die for it. But he's talking about Israel now. But I wish your, your truth would be translated all over. Let's understand how. So, what happened was, something transpired. You know what we say, it's called Ein Hara. What does Ein Hara mean? It means some things you've got to just conceal. You don't need to tell the world about it. Shh, keep quiet. It says that Rebbe, who was in a different time, Rebbe is a compiler of the Mishnah, had 24, the same number, 24 wagons of students. And they all died because of Ayin Hora at one point. A much smaller amount, but still. The number 24. What happened was, Rabbi Akiva's students got together in one place. And when they got to that number 24,000, the 24 was somehow the number of Ayin Hora. And they were gathered, and it was the most incredible scene. They gathered me, Geva Vad Anti Paras, from these two incredible, these two cities, and then from one to the next, you saw just the place was swarming with holy students of Rabbi Akiva. And because there was an Ayin Hara, that's why a slight infringement became magnified. That's what Ayin Hara does. If you're absolutely perfect, you can't be affected by Ayin Hara. Because we're not 100% perfect, when there's an Ayin Hara, it has an effect on the slight imperfection. And so it was a perfect storm. So it wasn't like they all sinned. They didn't sin. They were actually very holy people. But they just couldn't respect one another. And when they got to this point of 24,000, there was the Ayin Hara. So that answers those two questions. How could it be the students of Rabbi Akiva fall so low? They didn't. It was because they were students that they actually were trying to impress upon each other their path in learning. And why did they die in one time? Because it was just, they got to this point where they were all on such a high that the Ayin Hara was able to affect them for the slight infringement. So now everyone's gone. Dead. Who's responsible for the Ayin Hara? Ayin Hara? Everybody? Yeah, it just happens. So Rabbi Akiva now, Rabbi Akiva's incredible, yeah? That's a whole different story we once discussed that, I believe. He doesn't give up. What he did was he moved to another location. He said, okay, start again. And it was tough. He was a bit of a loser. Beforehand, he was sitting with these 24,000 giants. And now he's sitting around a little table with five people. It's like, oh, well. What a, like, you know, what a, what a disappointment. But he doesn't care. He's trudging along. Keeps on going. But now... He had to teach the five students a new path. How do, you, how do you respect someone and love them at the same time? How do you learn to totally and utterly disagree with someone and yet have complete, utter respect for them? What his students had failed at. That was the key point. How do we bring that across? It's how to learn to not how to learn to not be you. You gotta be yourself. You have to be able to learn and study and have a path and not and not like um, you know, some people are, are, are embarrassed of their path. No. Be courageous, be excited about who you are, proud, and yet you see the other person and you have absolute respect for the other person. How do you do that? Communication. Communication. There's something much deeper than communication. Communication stems from within. Something had to happen. And this key is the key of how you and I have this, have, are able to have obviously souls. Like how do you live with someone that you have issues with? <laughs> Sometimes there's major issues. You know, this week I had a, it was a real harsh, it was a Zoom we had on Coach Menachem. Very nice uh, podcast. Amazing. And there was a podcast. The podcast was how to have Shalom Bayes in divorce, which is a contradiction. 
how do you love hate at the same time like fight with someone completely and yet have absolute respect that you can produce good kids it's tough right when you have a shared love when you go deeper basically when you go deeper and it's a very difficult question it doesn't mean that oh I I, I respect you even though I'm really angry at you <clears throat> it's my ability to transcend the anger and to go deep Rabbi Shem Ben Yechoi had a student <clears throat> and the student one day <clears throat> had a problem because another student came back another student left Rabbi Shem. And this student went and he learned and became a successful doctor, whatever he became. He made a lot of money. He was a student of Rabbi Bar Yechoi, and he left Rabbi Shimon and he made a lot of money and he came back and he was showing his students, see, I'm a from guy and I have a lot of money. Now, you guys, just a bunch of losers, was the implied message. <coughs> You're staying, learning with Rabbi Shimon, and so you have no money and no future. Get some money. Most of the students couldn't care. They said, no, we're staying to learn Torah. We don't care. There was one student who was very moved and very influenced by this particular individual. And he says, Rebbe, I want money. I want to go out and make some money. It's very not politically correct to say that. It's a good story that happened once with uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe. You see it on, um, like he gets up, I think it was a poor and he announces, whoever wants money, raise your hand. <laughs> and all the Hasidim are there, and no, the middle of Purim, middle of a, like the Reb is asking, no one's raising their hand. Yeah. A few guys, a few, you know, misfits raise their hands. <laughs> and the Rebbe looks afterwards, if you, like right away, he said, he says, what's with you guys? I, I, Hashem was opening the heavens for that moment. I just felt, he was opening, and whoever asked would get those few guys who raised their hands became billionaires. Wow. <laughs> and he says, and Mepravichtik, like seriously, just if you want money, just say it. Wow. Then everyone raised their hands. He said, no, too late now. <laughs> it doesn't work after I told you. This student said he wanted money to Rosh B. Can you imagine what Rosh B would tell him? If a student says, all the other students get it, it's more important to be a student of Rosh B, of the Hebraic Kaddish, of a holy group of students than it is to go out and make money. I would think, I would think Rashbi would tell him, my dear student, he says, listen, you've got to learn Torah. You've got to understand how incredible it is to sit and study Torah. What do you want money for? That's what we do today. Right? When a kid says he wants to go work, you say, come on. You know what Rashbi did? He said, you want gold? No problem. Come with me. Takes him out to the valley. And he looks at the valley and he says, Rashbi looks, he has his power. He says, Bika, Bika, valley of valley, hitmal'i dina reizahav, fill up with gold coins. Wow. Wow. And suddenly, miraculously, wow. this valley was filled up with trillions of coins, gold coins. And he says to the students, These are all yours. You got it. You have studied Torah, and if you want, you can claim your reward in gold coins. You have a choice. Either you can claim it in spirituality or in the gold coins. So the student looks, he says, uh-oh, you mean that if I become wealthy and I take all this, I forfeit all my spiritual. Ah, and then he gets it. And he says, okay, I don't want it. And then he got it. You see the greatness of Rashbi? He doesn't impose on his student. He doesn't say, you should not want gold coins. You should not want money. He doesn't impose, he exposes. He says, okay, you want money? Good. I'll give it to you. And he goes to a valley. The valley is significant. Bik'ah. Some people on a mountain, on a high. Some people on a valley, in a low. Even when you're in a low, I'm going down into the valley with you. It's about your ability to understand and relate and appreciate the level that the student is standing on. And you go right down to his or her level, and in that level, you say, okay, how can I help you? That's being able to truly empathize with the other person. And that's the key. 
The key is don't impose, rather expose. Discover who they are and what they're about. Get to know who they are. The previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, once wrote a letter. He was writing letters to people. So he wrote a letter, and he's telling the, the secretary, he's transcribing the letter to the secretary. And he says, write this letter to this person. And start of the letter as follows. Titles of the person. So he wrote, so it was acronyms, which he would write. There was certain acronyms that he would write. He would say, Havosik v'chosiv, the pious one, Ishirei Likim, man who fears God, Nichbod v'nalo, honorable and exalted, and he went on and on in the praises. And the secretary is writing the letter, and he looks at his, like, usually you just transcribe, right? He says, Rebbe, just pointing out, this guy, his grandfather was a chassid of the Rebbe Maharash, or Tzamaq Tzedek, he says, but he, like, he, he's not at all, in, by any way, religious. He dropped everything. He doesn't keep any Judaism. He's not interested. In fact, he's a Jew-hater. And he's like, maybe you should write a different description of him. Don't write, you know, the Jew hater, but you could write, <laughs> just write, Smar, sir, but what are you writing all these descriptions for? And the Rebbe looks at him and he says, there wasn't a mistake. That's on purpose. The Rambam says that there's certain instances, like when a person doesn't want to give a get, and he's supposed to give a get, he says, you coerce him in ways and means, until he says, right, Sani, I want to give a get. Then he says, but how, how can you do that? You're not allowed to do that. You can't coerce a get. He says, no, it's not coercion. Because Yitzroy, honestly, his Yitzhahara has got the better of him. If the Torah says to do something and you don't want to do it, that's because the Yitzhahara has you in his clutches. You do want to do it. Every single Jew Inside of him is a Vasik Vachasid Ishireli Kim Nichbad Benale. He is a holy Jew. The trouble is, we're trained with external eyes. We look at everything from an external perspective. You don't look religious. You don't look like me, obviously, because I'm the most religious person ever, always, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't look like me, so therefore, you're not, no. And therefore, we look down at the person. Yeah. What you want to be able to do. It's not to say, okay, so stop looking down at them, look up. Everyone has qualities. No, not good enough. There's what's called primiyut. Primiyut means inside. Like the Mishnah says, Hevei shfal ruach, the Mishnah in Pirkei Avis, Hevei shfal ruach bifnei kol adam. If you look at the pnei of kol adam, at the primiyut of any person, you'll see God. In every single person. Every single person, every single Jew, you'll find Hashem. He's got a soul, he's got a neshama. And sometimes it's really difficult, you know, like when your child acts out and all you see is chitzoniyut, all you see is the external, and you cry out. There was this uh, kid we had in Yeshiva, and the kid was so mischievous. It was impossible. Like, this kid, uh, explain what kids are thinking. But in the middle of the night, he goes around, you know, when everyone's sleeping, he wakes up, or he didn't go to sleep yet, and goes to everyone's alarm clock and sets all the alarms to go at different hours of the night. <laughs> and like I was discussing with him, what, what are we supposed to do about this? Like you have to sometimes put your foot down and say, okay, that's it. So maybe that's true. You do have to put your foot down sometimes. You can't just let everything go slide. But I was talking to the principal and saying there's two ways of looking at it, he says. I was trying to do chesed. I was trying to be nice and do kindness and be good and compliment him and do everything. It's not working. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to start giving a knas. I'm going to find him and give him until he falls into submission. And he said, what should I do? I have to run each other. What else can I do? I can't, I can't do that. And I said to him, you know what? Maybe there's a third approach, an alternative approach. Clearly, a kid who does that is looking for attention. Something inside of him is desperate for attention. You know what you want to do? You want to give him that attention. He's like, I don't know how to, what should I do? I said, it's a little suggestion. 
before you come to yeshiva every morning, do a meditation. Close your eyes. Think of this particular child. You clearly have animosity towards him. He's making your life a misery. That's what's happening. What you want to do is close your eyes and meditate and reflect that this child has a neshama inside of him. This child clearly has seen something he shouldn't have seen. Something's gone wrong. He's looking, he's dying for attention. And before you can solve the problem, the first thing you want to do is meditate on how incredible it is that he has a neshama. He has a soul. He's special. He's unique. He's unreal. Stop seeing the chitzoniyut, because that's all you see is the external side of him every day. And start seeing the pnimiyut, the inside, the neshama of this being. If you walk into yeshiva, and you look at this child, and your eyes, instead of looking at the, what's going to be today? What are you, what's, what's in store today? Instead of looking at with those eyes, it's your energy that you're saying. There's nothing you have to say, just the energy. Look at the child and say, wow, it's true, you have some mischief, that's true. But I'm so focused on the fact that you're a vasik v'chasid ishirei lekim nichbad v'nale. I'm seeing you for a holy neshama. Because Hashem is being manifest through you. And I know that you're the most incredible kid. Like, you know, you could think in a different way. Like, in 20 years' time, he's going to be a very wealthy guy and he's going to fund your yeshiva. <laughs> now look at it. He's going to say, what happened 20 years ago? Whatever it takes to think of the kid in a holy light. And when you look at him as good, inherently good, you draw the good out of him. The new path of Rab Shimon is that if a student wants money, say, okay, let's go, let's go for money. Fine. It's the ability to undo what the mistake of Talmidah Rabbi Akiva was the first time. What was the mistake of the students of Rabbi Akiva? Is that if I have a path and you don't get it, I have to disrespect you. And it's true that your path might be wrong. Sometimes it might be truly, objectively wrong. Even then, even when you see and the guy is not doing any mitzvahs and nothing, it's your ability to put on your glasses of pnimiyut. And when you focus on the student and your friend and on another Jew, and all you see is a godly being, then you can make a change. It's like when a from person goes out there and he sees someone at work, and you look at that person and you see, and they say, I'm not religious. My mother was, I think my mother was Jewish. She was baptized. But yeah, she was Jewish. And you look at them and you say, I don't know what you mean. That means you're absolutely Jewish, just like me. And when you truly believe that, and your energy says, wow, you're part of the clan, you're part of us, that has an effect on the other person. Do you see what's happened to us? What's happened over the years, and it's quite an incredible achievement, is we started to get eyes of pnimiyut, of being able to relate to the world. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai went into the cave for the 13th year. Because after 12 years, he went out and he was burning everyone and everything. He would walk out and just see someone working on before Shabbos who just burn him up. So the heavenly voice says, go back into the cave. And this time you have another work in the cave, another avoider. Your avoider in the cave is to realize that you are Rosh B and you don't keep any mitzvahs because you're just so holy and so abstract. I want you to take the abstract and make it real. I don't want you to stop being abstract. I want you to take the abstract and make it real. And what that meant was that when you come out of the cave after one year, what did he learn to do? He learned that when you achieve the highest levels and relationship with God, you know what you discover? That what does God want? He doesn't want angels. He wants melocholaaretz kevodo. He wants humans, flawed humans. Those guys that you can't relate to, those guys who are so mischievous and impossible, those Jews out there, that's what he is interested in. And what he wants is that there should be people in this world who put on eyes of pnimiyut. And so that instead of exposing, instead of imposing, they expose. Imposing means you've got to be from. That's chitzoniyut. Pnimiyut is to be able to see the Jew for what he is. Rabbi Shimon, when he came out of the cave after 13 years, what was he doing? He would think he would go look to teach Torah, the Torah that he had learned. What does he do? He said the words, Ika milta de bayi le takune. He comes to a town and says, is there anything I can help you with? And they said, yeah, there's like Kehanim over here and they, they, there's like, you know, some dead corpse on this path and they can't walk through here. And so they have to go around. Oh, he says, there's a few Jews who I have a problem, an like inconvenience, I'm going to help them. And he helped them to allow them to walk in that path. They shouldn't be tummy. He was out to help another Jew. What is fixing up 
the students of Rabbi Akiva, the mistake of the students of Rabbi Akiva, it's the ability to say, I'm a Jew, I'm proud. I'm excited about who I am. I know who I am. I'm very cognizant of it. But I also am a student of Rabbi Shimon ben Yechoi and Rabbi Akiva. And I'm, even though at that time nobody was able to understand it because he said, you don't need to work. Hashem does everything for you. Hashem just automatically does everything is done for you. He says, guys, what I want you to do is to enter this world and I want you to put on glasses of Pnimiyut. And that means that you have to be religious and holy and everything you got to do. And then when you're looking at another Jew, you look and you say, hone in and you say, what do I see good about you? What's awesome about you? And I look at you as an neshama, I look at you as a light, and all I see is good. And the same applies when I look at any situation that happens. Whatever happens out there, I'm like, this is amazing. So, but you said yesterday was amazing, the opposite. Yeah. And today, this is what happens, so this is amazing. It's your ability to put on glasses and to understand that Hashem is always good. Everything that happens to Hashem is good. If it's happening to me, it has to be good. It's really hard. Because we only look at chitzoniyut. We only see the external, what meets the eye. And what Rashbi is about is pnimiyut. Rashbi revealed the Zohar. The Zohar is pnimiyut Torah. He says, go study the inside of Torah and you'll realize that the whole world is divine. There is nothing in the world that is not divine. Everything is Hashem. Everything you see is godly. And what Hashem does for you is He says, you know what? Put on those same spectacles. Put on those glasses and stop imposing and start stop exposing, start imposing. Stop looking at the world and saying, this is horrible, this is terrible. You say, this is really harsh. It's really difficult. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really battling. I'm suffering. I'm feeling a lot of pain. But then you look at the situation and you say, but Hashem made this. What's good here? And you put on your new glasses and you say, what can I expose good over here? And the very act of putting on those glasses allows you to start seeing great, incredible, unbelievable things in the world. And what happens is, as you start doing this, the halacha starts to follow Rabbi Shimon. Back in the day, halacha didn't follow Rabbi Shimon because nobody understood that. Today, we're starting to live in a world more and more and more. You'll notice it. Notice that if you start seeing good in another child, in a child of yours, or in another Jew, you will draw the good out of them. If a child says, Mommy, I want to go work. I don't want to learn Torah anymore. You empathize with that child. You say, you want money? I'll get you the money. Because I guarantee you there's something awesome and incredible and greatness inside that want of theirs. And it's when you stop thinking, Oh my gosh, my child's gone off. Oi! The second you think that, that, that becomes the reality. And when you manifest and start to realize that everything, whatever Hashem's will is amazing. Everything's incredible. And this child is incredible and you focus on that and you realize, no, 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 he's a godly child. Your ability to see the child in that light, the student in that light, is what brings it out. And you could do it with a fellow Jew and you could do it with any situation out there. Back in the day, Rashbi said, that you don't need to do anything. You're just going to need to go into a cave and learn Torah and you're fine. And I was like, what does that mean? We're beginning to understand. What it means is that if you lock yourself up into a relationship with Hashem and you start to appreciate God's presence in your life and you start to appreciate that Hashem has taken care of me and the situation is good and you realize that Hashem needs you to feel that and when you feel that, that itself draws that down. You're like, oh, that's what Rush B meant. He meant that when I learn Torah and I feel all the time and I daven and I allow Hashem's presence to penetrate me and so whenever I'm feeling disappointed, I'm starting, I'm acting out, okay, okay, this is hard, right? And Hashem's giving me a hug in this moment. Then what happens is, your, your feelings change the situation out there. When you start feeling Hashem's presence, the tracht gut, the vet sein gut happens out there. And because you feel Hashem's presence, it relates to the world out there. Rosh B says, you don't need to work. You don't need to do anything. We're getting there. We'll get into the realization that you don't need to work. You don't need to toil. You don't need to fight with your child about being religious. You just need to show the child that they're awesome in that amazing space and Hashem will do the rest. In any situation that happens, if you focus on the good, and it's hard work to focus on the good, it's really hard, but when you do, and you start seeing Hashem's presence right there, then Hashem's presence fills the whole world. That's the Simcha of Lagbona. 
Simchat Lag Baomer is a realization that Rosh B's path is the ultimate path and it's going to win. It's winning already because we're celebrating with Simcha. How do we celebrate Lag Baomer? It means a day in the middle of the morning you suddenly jump for joy. Why are you jumping for joy? Nothing good happened yet. Oh no, I started to look and to focus on how joyous and how incredible it is. And I put on the Pnimiyut. Pnimiyut means the internal. I start to expose every good and things out of life and I start seeing the goodness in my children, in my students, in the people around, the people that I meet, in the situations, and I start living in that space. And I expose the goodness because when I'm living in that space, the good just spreads all over. And you discover that the halacha gets paskin like Rav Shimon because that Pnimiyut that was hidden for so long in history, as we're entering the era of Geula, we bring about a Geula. When you are besimcha, when you're feeling happy, it's hard work to feel happy. But when you do, and you get excited about every little thing out there, then the whole world out there starts to jump for joy with you. And you start exposed to expose the goodness that lies inherently inside there. And that's our joy of Rashbi. And so, there's a parade tonight. <laughs> Come join in the parade. And when you're marching and feeling the Simcha of Rashbi, that's the power. Amazing. <coughs>